Hi, welcome to our Sunday morning uh, sermon. It'll be for August the 14th, 2022. And just a little bit of uh, announcements. There's a, there's a lot of prayer requests, uh, three important ones that we're focusing on. Uh, one is Glenn Bradford, still in the hospital, recovering from his quadruple bypass. And uh, he was on life support. And uh, last word we had that is he continues to be so. And, and but he, there is some improvement, some uh, what the doctor can call uh, some miraculous improvement. And so we just continue to pray for miracle in Glenn's life. We love him and his family. Uh, continue to pray for Andy. Andy will be going back to uh, Fresno to get more checked on. He does have a tumor in his, in his lungs, and and uh, they're going to be doing the biopsy and, and strategizing what to do next. So just pray for him and uh, continue to pray for Richard Souza. He is home uh, with Barbara and uh, had a complete hip replacement, and just pray for a complete recovery there. And so the other thing uh, I want to note um, is uh, Liz and I are going to take some time off. And so we, there will not be any more recorded sermons on the site uh, until September 11th. We're going to take about a month. Go see her family. <clears throat> just lost her brother-in-law. We're going to go spend time with her sister and just take a little bit of a sabbatical leave and, and uh, just uh, pray for us as we travel. And uh, uh, there will be uh, no Sunday evening uh, services starting next week. Uh, WANA will be starting September 11th. We'll be back uh, Sunday, September 11th. In the meantime, Silas Verinder will be uh, taking care of Sunday mornings, Larry Milliken Wednesday evenings. And those uh, messages will be, uh, I believe, uh, the audio will be on our website, BCC LeGrand. Uh, dot com, so you can uh, check those out if you want to um, to listen to them. But there won't be any recordings until we get back on September 11th. So uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We pray, God, that you have your hand upon um, the church, hand upon uh, our travels, and Lord, our hand upon uh, Lord Glenn and Andy and Richard and Charlotte and others that are really going through some physical uh, infirmities and struggles. I pray, Lord, for the body of Christ in our country. Pray for our nation. Pray for, Lord, uh, the Ukraine and things going on there and Afghanistan and the mission work being done by missionary Matt Johnson. We just continue to pray for your uh, continued uh, reign over the universe, Lord. We love you for your salvation. Uh, I'm going to see, Lord, some of our responsibilities today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's get right into the message. Uh, it's in Acts 22. In Acts 22, if you remember at the end of Acts 21, Paul is taken, he's beaten. As he's beaten, he is then dragged in by the government, and they don't really know what's going on. If you look at Acts 21, um, Verse 37, Paul speaks to them in Greek. And verse 38 of Acts 21, they thought he was uh, an Egyptian, and they were shocked that he could speak in Greek. As though at the end, um, he asked for permission to speak to the people who had just beaten him. And they give him um, permission. And he stood on the stairs, and he motions with his hands, verse 40 of chapter 21, and spoke to them in Hebrew. This is important. He speaks to the Romans in Greek. He speaks to the uh, Jews in Hebrew. Paul has been uniquely created by God with the ability to reach a multitude of people. And, and these are, are gifts that God has bestowed upon him through his many experiences in life. And so now, this is part two. Part one last week, we talked about the idea of how to handle when we are being um, de debated and uh, defamed and and hindered by those around us, whether it's within the church, whether it's the world, whether it's the government or those in authority over us. Uh, and, and we came to the conclusion through the study of scripture that it was, there are certain ways to handle these things, but all of them lead to an opportunity to share the gospel. And that's what Paul is using this for. 
And so as he gathers the people around, he begins to speak. Look at verse 1 of chapter 22. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, so he has their attention. This is a man that the soldiers, because of the violence, we back in chapter 21, verse 25, or 35, we see by the violence that they actually had to drag him into the barracks that he could walk on his own. And now he's allowed to step outside of this place on these stairs, and he begins to speak in Hebrew. And I think the people are stunned. People who know him are stunned that he wants to talk at all. Uh, the people that don't know him are stunned because he speaks in Hebrew. Uh, but just the fact that he's probably bloodied and beaten. And what does he have to say? What does he want to say to us? And so Paul uses this opportunity uh, to defend his faith. Look at that verse one. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you. And that word defense in the Greek, it's apologia, A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A. Uh, it's, if you've ever heard the term apologetics, which is the defense of our faith, uh, the ability to explain to somebody why we believe the Bible's true, why we know that God is real, why we have changed our entire life to follow Christ, uh, why we defend um, creation, why we defend salvation, why we defend marriage and scriptures, and all of these things that we stand for. Um, uh, the Bible says in 1 Peter 3, if you, if you want to turn there, that we have this responsibility. 1 Peter 3, 14 says, even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And don't be afraid of their threats or be troubled. But sanctify or separate the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. So this is where Paul is. Paul is standing ready to give a defense to those who have defamed him. And Peter writes this in 1 Peter 3 to a church that was under tremendous persecution. And he says, look, it, just be ready when people want to know about this hope that is within you. Be ready to defend or apologize. And that's not as I'm sorry because I'm a Christian. It is the idea of explaining where you stand with God, why you stand with God, using the scriptures, using the word of God. That is apologetics or defense. And so Paul is going to stand <clears throat> and give us defense. So a lot of times when you're under verbal attacks, um, people will stop and say, well, explain, well, how can you follow such a, how can you believe in a God that would do this? Or how can you trust in a God? Or how can you be so foolish to follow these religious things? Well, if they're asking you those questions, you might have a chance to calmly defend your faith. This is why I believe what I believe. Which brings me to the next question. Do you know why you believe? Yeah, we trust God by faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But there is logic to faith. Christian. There is an intellectual design all through the universe. There is evidence of Christ. The Bible says in Romans 1 that creation itself declares the very glory of God in his creation. And it's not him. So that's where he is. And so what Paul then proceeds to do is give his testimony. And, and this is really important. We're going to see what Paul does as he defends his faith. He does not give some grand, deep, theological Greek and Hebrew breakdown of Christianity. He simply tells his story. Look at verse 3. 
I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you are all today. I persecuted this way to death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. As also the high priest bears me witness in all the counsel of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains <clears throat> those who were here there to Jerusalem to be punished. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he says, I was just like you. I persecuted the way. He says that verse four, the way is, is the, the title for Christianity in those times. Uh, because their message was Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. So they got this title of people of the way. Well, he begins to tell the story of his salvation that we first saw in Acts chapter 9. This isn't the only time he's going to share this story. He's going to tell this story in Acts 26. He's going to tell the story in Philippians 3. He's going to tell the story in Second in 1 Timothy 1. And the reason he continues to repeat it is because it's his story. His story is his story. And that becomes what we kind of call our testimony. Why we believe in what we believe. For me, the testimony is that I was completely changed on Easter Sunday, 1979. And it was such a dramatic interchange that I've never shaken. Uh, and I know what happened now. I didn't know it then, but I know that what happened to me on Easter Sunday, 1979, as I sat in my car in the parking lot of the pizza McDonald's, that grace was given to me. Faith, or by grace, he is saved through faith. It's a gift of God. And what was given to me that day was a gift of faith, uh, but not knowing whether God was real absolutely knowing for sure i just knew it it was a gift not of works i don't have nothing to boast about my sister had died and a year or so went by and i was still trying to figure out what happened to her where she went and so when when i heard the message of the death burial and resurrection on easter sunday um and i was presented with the opportunity to go to heaven and someone had told me that my sister had become a Christian and I didn't even know what that meant and I just went out to my car and I asked God I said God if I, if I knew for sure that you were real I've, I have no choice but to follow you why would you not follow the God who created you and I was ready I just needed to know and I asked him for that knowledge and I believe that God gave this gift of faith that day because I've never been the same. I can't explain to you what happened, but I was completely changed. And so this was Paul's testimony that he was just like them. They dragged him and they beat him no different than he did with Stephen and others. Um, so how could he really be critical of these Jews? And he says to them, all these Jews know that who I was. I was a zealous for the law, a Pharisee. And, and this is what's called, to me, I call it, no one has called this probably, uh, but it reminds me of what I was taught years ago by somebody, something called the feel, felt, found uh, ministry. And basically what feel, felt, found is, is that as you're talking to somebody about their life and you've had similar experiences, you can say to that person, I know exactly how you feel. Because I felt the same way. The Bible says in Corinthians that the God of all comfort comforts you in times of trials so that you then will have the ability to comfort others also when they go through the same thing. Um, Liz and I, we lost our son Samuel 30 years ago. And it was a hard thing. He was two weeks from, from his due date. And he... Um, Died in the womb of Liz. And we had to deliver Samuel. And we had a, a pretty difficult time, obviously. Um, 
But over the 30 years since, Liz has had the opportunity to minister and comfort uh, young ladies who have gone through the similar thing. And uh, they can't look at Liz and say, you have no idea what I'm going through. This year. Liz can look at those young ladies and say, I know how you feel. I felt what you're feeling. So I found comfort in Christ. You see, I know how you feel. I felt the same way. I found something that changed everything. And I was this 19-year-old kind of agnostic, liberal-minded person that never thought about eternity. I was completely changed. So if you have doubts about God or you don't want anything to do with God, I know how you feel. I felt the exact same way. So I found out that I was completely wrong about the universe and about creation and about mankind and about sin and about God. And it didn't change. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying to them in these first three verses, three through five, look at I know exactly what you're going through. I did the same thing. But it happened, verse 6, as I journeyed and came near Damascus, about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone round about me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. Now, Acts 9 says they heard the voice, but we learn later that all they heard was a noise. They didn't hear, they didn't understand what was being said. Only Paul understood what was being said. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? So I want to look at verse 10. We talked about this in Acts 9. Who, who are you, Lord? Saul, why are you persecuting me? I answered, who are you, Lord? And he immediately responded, I am Jesus. And this is the revelation that happens to every Christian at the time of their salvation in which they simply come to the realization that Jesus Christ is Lord. Paul said, who are you, Lord? I said, God, if I knew you were real, I would follow you. Other people, it's coming to the Bible, the church, reading their Bibles, listening to the radio, hearing the gospel message. And the gospel message is simple. Romans 3.23, we've all sinned. Romans 6.23, the payment for sin is death. Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his love for you that while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. And Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he's risen from the dead, you'll be saved. So that story, that truth of the universe, we've all sinned. Death is the payment, which means separation from God. Jesus in his love and compassion, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will never perish, but have everlasting life. And so I'm telling you, God created the world, created the universe, created Adam and Eve. Adam sinned, and that sin is passed to all men. So now we cannot be in unity with God because of our sin. It separates us from God, death. But God took care of this by sending his son to be the propitiation of the full payment for our sin. And so Paul says to God, who are you, Lord? And the answer from God is, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And then in verse 10, he immediately says to Jesus, what shall I do, Lord? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. According to verse 10, Paul believed in what the voice had said. I'm telling you that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you believe in him and surrender your life to him, he will save you, wash your sins away, and you will be uh, in the firm palm of his hand that no one can pluck out. If you don't believe me, you're not. He that has the Son hath life. He that has not the Son hath not life. So this is salvation for Paul. He has a choice here. Who are you, Lord? Well, I'm Jesus. And his response isn't, 
well, I don't want nothing to do with you. I'm persecuting your people. Leave me alone. His response is, what shall I do, Lord? Jesus says, why do you call me Lord and not do the things that I say? Paul's ready to do what he says right away. Look at verse 10 again. What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise, go to Damascus. You'll be told all the things which are appointed for you to do. So Paul knows exactly how these Jews feel that just beat them to pulp. Because he did the same thing. I know how you feel. How do I know how you feel? Because that's how I used to feel. I felt the same way until I found Jesus. See, here's the point. Do you really think anybody is going to be able to talk Paul out of his faith after this experience of going blind, hearing the voice of God, hearing Jesus himself? That light that shone, it's an experience he's never going to forget. And he repeats this testimony over and over again in Philippians and Timothy and three times in the book of Acts. Why? Because it's his story. What's your story? Not my story. You have a story about God? If you don't, maybe that's why your faith is a little bit uh, strained a little bit. You say, well, Pastor John, I don't have a story. You should do. If you know Jesus, you have a story. You have a time where he comforted you, a time where he, he confirmed in you that he was real. Even if you grew up in a Christian home and don't remember the time that you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, if you just always believed, you have that moment. I won't get into the details of it, but I remember when our daughter was going off to college, it was very difficult for me as a daddy and a daughter. Um, it was difficult to see her go. And as we dropped her off to school, uh, she gave a little envelope to Liz and I and said, just don't read it till you get home. And when it, we read it, without going into the details of it, it had a moment that in, in early college, junior college years, uh, uh, when God confirmed to her that he was, and that becomes her testimony, you see. And I grew up in a Christian home. My dad was a pastor. But then she has a separate moment all to herself. What a beautiful thing. And a comfort for a parent. I know how you feel. I felt the same way. But I found the truth. That's the testimony of every Christian. The next thing that Paul does is he, he tells them, so because of this radical change in my life, this event that cannot be shaken from me, it is not made up. It actually happened. From this point on, I live for Jesus. Verse 11. Since I could not see for the glory of the light being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came to Damascus. Then a certain man named Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me, stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight at the same hour. I looked up to him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be a witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I was in a trance. I saw him saying to me, make haste, get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was standing by consenting to his death, guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. And he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. So Paul obeys God, goes to Damascus, and when he gets there, God sends a man named Ananias. God goes to Ananias in Acts 9, tells him to lay hands on Paul to give him the sight back, and let Paul know that he's a chosen vessel of mine. And when he gets to Paul, he says, look it, you're a chosen vessel of mine. And Paul doubts it. He says, how can this be? I'm, I'm a murderer. I consented to the death of Stephen. 
these people are going to want uh, on both sides. The Christians won't accept me because I persecuted and murdered them. The Jews won't accept me because I'm a traitor. And God says, just do what I ask you. I'm going to send you far from here to the Gentiles. And so Paul is explaining to them his life. 2 Corinthians 5.14, Paul writes this, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Paul says once, once we become followers of Christ, we no longer live for ourselves. We live for the one who died for us. Verse 16 says, therefore, from now on, I regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Now all things are of God. So Paul is telling them that the love for Christ, that God would forgive Paul all of his infirmities and sins tell you what it is a heartbreaking thing to not be forgiven i hate the flesh that's within me, the sin that dwells within me. and that god loves me you believe that i i know many of you watching this don't but god does and, and god has completely washed away my sins if you go back to verse 16 look what it says it says Arise and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, it's not the baptism in the water that washes the sins away. It's the calling on the name of the Lord. And that baptism is the washing away of your sin. Don't get confused that baptism is what washes your sins away. It doesn't. Thief on the cross was never baptized, but his sins were washed away. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Ethiopian in the book of Acts came to Philip and said, what hinders me from being baptized? And he says, well, you have to believe first. Believe and then baptize us to believe. That saves you. Whoever believes in him will never perish. <clears throat> so Paul was completely changed. And what changed in him is he said, now I do whatever God says. And God is the one who told me to go to the Gentiles. I know you guys don't like the fact that I go to the Gentiles. But I've got to do what God says to do. That's why I preach. I made a commitment to God that I would follow him. And for 40 years, I have been stumbling through that. Not doing a very great job, but trying really hard. I'm still a little selfish and I'm still a little uh, fleshy. Maybe a lot. But God wants me to preach. And that's what I'm bound and determined to do until he tells me to stop preaching. Um, that could be any time. Um, am I qualified to preach? Many people think not. But the Bible says I use the foolish, the found the wise, the weak, the base. Well, if that's what God is looking for, maybe we are all qualified. We just simply obey God. That's what we do. We completely change at the time of our salvation. So the truth of the matter is, this is a great testimony. His defense of his faith is this. Stop, everybody. I know how you feel. I felt the same way. I used to be just like you. I was arrested and persecuting and murdering. But you have to know what happened to me. I had nothing to do with this. I was a chosen vessel stopped by God in my tracks on my way to arrest more people. The voice of heaven came and it identified himself as Jesus. What other choice did I have but to surrender myself to this Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and I have been following them ever since. That's my story. Sticking to it. That's what it is. Well, of course, the people are going to say, well, oh, we didn't know that. We completely understand. We are so sorry that we persecuted you. Is that what's going to happen? 
Absolutely not. It doesn't always happen that way. Look at verse 22. They listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth. He's not fit to live. Not fit to live. What did he do wrong? Nothing. As long as he was murdering and persecuting innocent people, he was fully acceptable by the world. By the world. Once he stopped, they wanted him dead. Why? Because of the last thing he says, God sent me to the Gentile. We will not have that. This man who calls him a man of the law would go to these Gentiles and not even have them circumcised. They are dogs and lowlifes, these Gentiles not have it. And as they cried out, verse 23, they tore their clothes through the dust in the air. The commander ordered them to be brought to the barracks and said that, that he should be examined under scourging so that they may know why they shouted so against him. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, do not marvel if the world hates you. Jesus himself says in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. While he was persecuting and murdering, they all loved him. Yet because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You are also a chosen vessel. I don't know why God would choose us. I don't know why God would set us apart. I don't know why God would use us. To those who say I'm unqualified, you're exactly right. And so is everybody else in this entire world. And yet Christ, in his incredible compassion, mercy, grace, forgives us, chooses us to do his work. What a privilege it is. If you're not involved in the work of God, you're missing out. A blessing it is to be part of it. It's hard work, not always easy. And the world attacks you. And marvel not if they hate you. But I'm only interested in pleasing one person. And I fight hard every day to please God. If I do that, guess what? If I'm pleasing God, then I'm pleasing my wife, I'm pleasing my children, I'm pleasing the church and the body and the friends and those around me because I'm doing the things I'm supposed to do. So they take him and they're going to scourge him. And the reason they're going to scourge him is because they're trying to appease these Jews and, and stop this riot. And they want to find out the truth. So a scourging is a very horrific. It's, it's tying those hands together and getting those whips with the metal and the glass. And it is uh, not meant to kill, although sometimes it does. Uh, but it's meant to get some truth. It's, it's a torture. To get the person to speak and to talk. So verse 25, they bound him with thongs, and that's ropes. Paul said in the, to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, take care what you do. This man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said, Tell me, are you a Roman? He said, yes. The commander answered, with a large sum of money, I obtained my citizenship. And Paul said, I was born a citizen. This is something so important. You are uniquely created. All of your experiences of your past, all the good and the bad, have molded you to be the person God needs in certain places to do certain things. Paul is so unique. He is a Pharisee, a, an expert of the law, an expert in Hebrew. He's also Greek. Growing up in Tarsus, a kind of a Greek realm. But he's also a Roman citizen. Well, where does the Roman citizenship come in? Well, the commander bought it with a large sum of money. And there are certain ways for non-Romans to earn Roman citizen, just as as, as there are legal ways for people from other countries to become legal citizens of the United States. And so you could bribe your way into Roman citizenship, which is apparently what happened with this commander. It cost him a large sum of money. Sometimes you are granted Roman citizenship because of a good deed or, or something that was deemed helpful to the government. 
And because Paul was born a citizen, it is either his father or grandfather or somebody had to be granted this Roman citizenship. He didn't pay for it himself. He didn't bribe his way into it. He was born, which gave him a little bit more clout than even the commander. Where you might ask, well, how do they know? What if, what is, what if he's lying? Well, one of the things is, is, is if you read in the Roman laws, the, the penalty for, for faking it and pretending it like you would if you were uh, trying to fake yourself into being a police officer or something like that, it was, it was, uh, it was death and it was a horrific death. And so people just didn't do it. And here is Paul uniquely, how God is protecting him. Jewish man, Hebrew, Pharisee, Greek speaking, Roman citizen. God can use him in so many different areas and places. This is why God not only chose him as a, a chosen vessel, but uniquely prepared him. And uh, as, as we come towards the you know, sunset of ministry and we look back a little bit, there have been some unique things. Uh, I had a little bit of a, a, a session with sports. Um, and I have a quirky little strange sense of humor. And I'm kind of sensitive. I have this hatred for conflict. I have a lot of little flaws and chinks in the armor that have all been beneficial in certain times in my life for ministry. Um, they're not gifts and talents. Some of them are flaws and, and weaknesses. Paul says, I glory in my weaknesses. And you have the same thing. You're unique. There are things about you that, that allow you to minister in certain ways in certain areas. And here's Paul uniquely qualified. Well, immediately in verse 29, those who were about to examine him with, withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid after he found out he was a Roman citizen because they already bound him. They already broke the law. Jews get no trial. They get treated like slaves. Roman citizens cannot be bound without cause, without a trial. And so they've already violated the law. And those two commanders very nervous. They had no idea this guy was Roman. The next day, he wanted to know for certain why he was accused of the Jews. He released him from his bonds, commanded the chief priests and the council to appear, and brought Paul down and set him before them. And now they're going to have a proper Roman trial because this Roman citizen is being accused by these Jews of something the commander has no idea what it is. And so Paul spends this chapter giving his testimony. And our testimony is going to be helpful in, in the, the tough times that we've gone through because we can look people in the eye. We can tell them, man, I know how you feel. I felt the same way. So I found something that fits me. Understand that you're on trial. The Bible is clear about this. Romans 12.10 as I heard a voice in heaven saying, now salvation and strength and kingdom of God and power of Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren, Satan, who has accused them before God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Amen. And the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to death. So the Bible says that, that Satan, Spends day and night accusing. There's a lot to accuse us for. Trust me, many of my actions are not Christ-like actions. And Satan can take those and say, look it, he's a sinner. Deserves hell. Doesn't deserve to be with you. Doesn't deserve to be behind that pulpit. Praise God. The Bible says, my little children, these things I write unto you is that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, 1 John 2, 1. There is one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. 
1 Timothy 2, 5, Jesus is our mediator. And he was a, gave himself to be a ransom for all. So in verse 11 of Re Revelation 12, we are saved by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. What is our testimony? That we have trusted in the blood of the lamb. So when we stand before and Satan says, that Flanagan is guilty. He is a sinner. My testimony is, but I have trusted in the blood of Christ. And through the blood of Christ, my sins are washed away clean and made me white as snow. They're as far as the east is from the west. And my advocate, my lawyer, Jesus Christ. That's what an advocate is. It's a lawyer. My mediator. My king stands at the right hand of God, making intercession for me. Let's close with Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Man, we read these verses a lot around here because they're incredible verses. It says, what then shall we say to those things that God is for us? Who can be against us? He's our mediator. He's our advocate. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How we, how shall we not with him also freely give him all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Is God who justifies. God's the judge. Satan says he is a sinner, deserving of hell. And God says he is a saint, washed clean of his sins. Look at verse 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. That's the court case. We stand guilty of sin and yet made completely innocent by the judge and the mediator himself. And that, that, that Satan, that, that prosecutor, continues day and night trying to convince God that you do not deserve heaven, you do not deserve salvation, and you are not truly a Christian. And God says, get the behind me, Satan. He is a chosen vessel of mine. No one will ever pluck him out of my hand. Because verse 35 says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written? For your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to slaughter. Yet in all things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loves us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Man, we have a great mediator. We have a great king we have a great god who's the judge and they're all on your side and if god is for us nobody can be against us marvel not that the world hates you know your story your story is i know how you feel that was me i felt the same way until i found the answer to everything Christ Jesus, and now my testimony is I trusted him. I believe that his son died for me, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, and that he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. Because of that faith that was given to me by God, I will never be plucked out of his hands, and I will never be separated from him, and I'm on my way to heaven, no matter what the world tells me, no matter what Satan accuses me. That's our testimony. That's our story. That's our defense. Never apologize for your apologetics. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all you've done for us. Bless this day. And Lord, if anybody here does not have this unbelievable freedom in salvation, Lord, may they find it through your words and through the drawing of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Remember, uh, there will be no more recordings till uh, September 11th, but there are some... Uh, um, audio that'll be on bccthegrand.com and other sermons in there if you want to listen to. We'll uh, talk to you in about a month. God bless you. Have a uh, great